All right. He um, hello, everybody, and thank you again for coming to our Progressing and Planning event. Um, as you will have seen from the announcement today, we are talking about micromobility and the last mile, and we're really fortunate to have some excellent speakers today, and I have to always say um, excellent speakers who are ex-MSC regional and urban planning students, so always makes me happy. Um, but today we have with us um, Marianne Mackendo, who is the head of ESG strat um, strategy and engagement at Uber. She's going to be talking to us about end-to-end -end and trip planning and the role of data in micromobility um, and challenging the last mile. We have Marion Lagadic, who is a project manager at 6T, and she's going to talk to her, talk to us about her research on micromobility in Paris. We have Ollie Balderson, who's a principal consultant at Momentum Transport, and he's going to talk to us about density and modality, um, inter-suburb trips and last mile delivery. And then finally, we have Max Myers, who's a recent graduate and was our Orem scholarship holder. So welcome back, Max. He is now at the um, Northeast Maglev um, Transport, and he is a planning analyst and urban strategist. And he's going to be starting us off today and talking about an introduction on uh, micromobility and last mile and the connections between rail and micromobility, which is one of his specialisms. So I am going to go ahead and pass over to you, Max, and let you start. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Nancy. All right, let me just go full screen and then share screen. Uh, all right is it can we just nod that it is up there you can you see it. it okay great um yeah so so thank you again for that introduction nancy so um after uh, just before i get started so yeah after i uh finished the lse program last year um i've since been working for the northeast maglev so we are partnered with uh, japan rail central which uh, pretty much our goal is to bring superconducting maglev uh uh, trains to the United States, specifically between Washington, D.C. and New York City. Uh, this is a picture of the train in Japan. And um, so the only reason I mention that is because, yes, it kind of informed a lot of the research that I did with micromobility over the past year. So as the um, first kind of uh, speaker here today, I thought I'd kind of just give a quick slide on introducing the overall first and last mile issue. So really with um, and, and public transport, which is what I'm most interested in, is there's always three stages of a uh, of a trip. There's the access, so going from your starting location to say the train station or the bus station. There's then the main stage, so taking the train or the bus and then uh, getting from that stop to your final destination. So access and egress are really just other kind of words for the first and last mile. And they're really viewed disproportionately more um, than the rest of the trip. So even if you have a great train trip that takes you 40 miles, if you have a really bad experience getting from the station to your final destination, that might only be a mile, it kind of cancels out the great 40 miles that you just had. Um, so why are these solutions difficult? Well, first, uh, multimodal trips just have a lot of built-in disutilities, uh, like wait times, delays, confusion. Um, there was an interesting study that I came across uh, doing my dissertation research that showed that out of vehicle transport time, so say time waiting at a train station or waiting time not moving is valued at two to two and a half times greater. So let's just say you had a 25 minute multimodal trip, uh, but 10 minutes of that was waiting at a bus station or a rail station. That would be equivalent to someone of saying, I could just get in my car for 40 minutes rather than doing a 25 minute multimodal trip. And then also just our cities have been designed for cars for the last 60 years. Um, and really cycling and now micromobility really up, up until recently have, a, have kind of only been thought of as an add-on to a car-centric city, not as a core transport component. Luckily, I think that's changing. So uh, what is micromobility and kind of what are we talking about today? So micromobility are really uh, personal transportation vehicles um, that, you, well, it depends on the definition you use, but, but, but that weigh less than 35 kilograms, um, at least according to the OECD. And they have really exploded in popularity over the last uh, few years. So things like e-scooters, e-bikes, um, even e-skateboards, et cetera. And I think that they really present a kind of an opportunity to, comp uh, to work with uh, public transport. Um, so kind of what was my research question? What did I look at for the past year with, with LSC and then in a report with Ali? Really, how can we embed these, this growing kind of phenomenon of micromobility 
with major uh, rail termini and being at LSE, I figured what's a better city than London to study. And I think it's it's interesting because I think micromobility is kind of the new kid on the block and rail, which is kind of the oldest form of legacy transport and seeing that how they are complementary um, uh, was really interesting. And specifically with London, um, in recent years, London has made great strides in cycle provisions, parking, safe routes, et cetera. However, um, a lot of their documentation, like even the cycle action plan, London even has a cycle parking plan, which most cities don't have. Um, they don't, they, they barely mention e-bikes and they don't mention e-scooters or scooters at all. So um, we just have to avoid becoming what um, an article that Nancy had us read last year, um, they, they call Frankenstein urbanism, which is pretty much, you sometimes have these really cool new ideas coming into cities, but if you don't have the good planning around them, then, um, well, it just becomes like Frankenstein in a failed experiment, and we don't want Frankensteins. Um, so um, just, I can blow through these, just some of the benefits at micromobility at stations. So number one, uh, with public transport, so especially for a, a city like London, where you have peak hour tube capacities already at demand. I mean, I don't know if any of you have tried to get on the central line at peak hour. Uh, it's pretty much the Hunger Games. Um, so if you could have people that ride, uh, that can get an e-scooter rather than going on like one or two stops from King's Cross, that's a win. Also, a lot of urban regeneration benefits, um, you know, more people on streets leads to uh, helps nearby shops, the attractiveness of the public space. Uh, there's a ton of passenger benefits like time savings, et cetera. And then also the rail operators benefits. So there's a lot of studies that show uh, improved first and last mile connectivity would actually is better to increase market share for rail providers than actually expanding capacity to the railway, which would be, uh, or improving service which is much more expensive. Um, so kind of now getting into what some of my research did specifically is, you know, talking in London, micromobility really hasn't come up, it's starting to come up in discussions, but they're they're not mature yet. Um, then we have an issue, which I, I know some of the other um, panelists are gonna probably go into more, um, this whole idea of private versus shared micromobility. So do you have, you know, there's companies like uh, Lime and Bird and Spin, et cetera, where you can kind of share a vehicle or do you buy your own? Um, and I think my research showed, I was actually pretty conclusive that uh, shared is the way to go because you can't have that many people bringing private micro vehicles onto trains. And also um, uh, there's this idea of renewable versus finite station access. So if you have a commuter that comes and parks their bike or parks their car at a station in the morning and doesn't pick it up until the, the end of the day, you essentially lose that space for the entire day. But with shared micromobility, it's kind of renewable and it's going in and out throughout the day. And then there's this issue of dockless versus dock. So kind of do you have the bulky infrastructure where you can park uh, your micro vehicles or um, dock less where you don't have that. And I think what's in the, the, the interviewees that I spoke with over the past year were clear that they see dockless mobility uh, as being better. However, dockless doesn't necessarily mean you can just park it anywhere. You still need to have clearly allocated parking areas, but um, you, you, you don't have to have like kind of the big Santander cycles or city bike racks to put it in. So with now all the, the, the wordy slides done, just to uh, another minute or so, um, one of the cool research things that are interesting things that came out of my research was um, this idea of private micromobility operators renting uh, space within stations. Because um, the research, everyone pretty much said cycle parking is already limited and even outside parking is limited at most stations. So, you know, where's, where's the space? Where can we make this? So the interesting thing is if you have these for-profit companies, essentially, instead of having maybe 47 sandwich shops that are all redundant at like a King's Cross station, maybe you have 46 sandwich shops and then, and then have here a micromobility hub. Um, and as you can see on the right side though, the key is that there would be direct street access so people wouldn't be riding into the concourse. Um, so this is one idea. And then for other stations, so this is actually would be the outside of King's Cross station. When you do have public ground parking, here's like a rendering of um, what micromobility parking could be here. And um, again, this isn't, um, and, and will require um, a lot of coordination between network rail, TFL, the boroughs, et cetera. Uh, and then my last slide um, is another thing that was pretty clear throughout the interview is, is that um, right now, when a lot of people are looking for shared micromobility, um, you'll have your smartphone, you'll have an app that kind of tells you where you can get one. However, there's really not a lot of signage um, in real life that kind of We'll, we'll show people. So it's just this idea of having um, real world signage. So you can see it says micromobility hub on the um, there that would complement um, the uh, the 
what, what it says on people's phones. And um, so yeah, that's just a very high level um, introduction. And then just the la last thing I'll show here is this is a rendering of our, um, my company's uh, Baltimore station and we're about two and a half miles, so I guess four kilometers from kind of the traditional uh, CBD. So we're actually, you know, actively looking at first and last mile and how we're gonna get our passengers there. And um, hopefully I didn't go over my time too much, but uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that, Max. Um, we're doing fine. And uh, Marion, I will pass over to you to um, start. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, so today I would like to contribute to this discussion of micromobility and the last mile about bringing it some results we gathered in Paris. Uh, my firm 60 is a social sciences research firm specialized in mobility and we are based in Paris where micromobility boomed really fast starting from 2017. Um, and so we, we have the necessary time to reflect on how these services might have contributed to easing first mile, last mile mobility in Paris. So a key result that we found uh, when we surveyed uh, dockless bicycle and dockless e-scooter users, so we, uh, we focused on the service aspect of micromobility, not on privately owned micromobility vehicles. Uh, so a key result was that these services are really useful intermodal trips. 27% uh, of dockless bicycle trips in Paris were intermodal trips in 2019. Uh, 23 to 27% of uh, dockless e-scooter trips were also intermodal. And by comparison, only 9% of regular bicycle trips are intermodal in Paris. So it, it looks like these services really uh, east these intermodal trips, especially in a city so dense as Paris is, where parking your own bicycle close to a metro station can be quite hard. Uh, so these results are really interesting, really encouraging, um, but I would like to put them into context a bit because Paris is a very specific uh, city with, because it has one of the densest metro networks in the world. Uh, on average, between two metro stations in Paris, you have about uh, 500 meters, so about a five minute walk. So accessing a metro station is not an issue within Paris. It might be in the suburbs, uh, but micromobility operators so far have focused on the inner city of Paris and have not uh, serviced the suburbs. Uh, so in Paris, we found that accessing public transport was not really the issue, but uh, micromobility users wanted to improve their experience, maybe avoid a correspondence, maybe spend a little bit more time outside. Uh, and that was a key asset of these services. Another important thing is that uh, on the discussion about first mile, last mile mobility, we are really trying to find uh, daily systems through which people would um, move away from their private car and go into public transport. In Paris, uh, not only did micromobility services not really capture car trips, uh, but it's also worth underlining that they are not used very frequently. Uh, we found that only 6% of users uh, we surveyed used dockless e-scooters every day, 13% uh, used it two or three times a week. Uh, so what would it take to make these services uh, daily options, uh, especially given that they, are, they can be quite expensive, especially for long trips? Uh, so that's the specific case of uh, Paris. Uh, if we compare it to a city like London, the prospects might be very different because the metro network is less dense. Uh, stations can be separated by up to, to six kilometers, so there is a greater issue of access. Uh, but then if micromobility services are to be used to ease access, there's another issue which is fleet density. Uh, we found in Paris that 43% of user surveys were not willing to walk more than two minutes to find an e-scooter, and the next 46% will not be willing to walk more than five minutes. So for e-scooters to be attractive as a service, they need to be everywhere. And for access and egress, they also need to be, to be easy to find and they will be scattered after the last mile. So that's a management issue. Um, so how has that been addressed in Paris? 
the Paris City Hall has regulated uh, these services since March, uh, uh, May of uh, 2020 and created e-scooter parking area. So I'm focusing on e-scooters because we don't really have dockless bicycles anymore in Paris. Um, so all the red dots on this map are e-scooter parking areas and in total uh, they can welcome up to 15,000 e-scooters. So as you can see, the network is very, very dense. Uh, in the city center, uh, on average, it will take 70 meters to find an e-scooter and even on the outskirts one will not have to walk more than 135 meters to find an e-scooter so that's the level of density we have uh, in paris uh, is it the reason why uh, these services can be uh, attractive for intermodality this is something that we need to investigate but a key issue that raises is how to bring uh, such a reliability outside of dense city calls uh, as paris so thank you very much Thank you very much, Mariel. That is, um, I think this is going to turn out to be a very interesting discussion when we get it all put together. Um, we'll take our questions at the end for everyone to discuss. Um, and we've got some very interesting ones coming in already. So please, everyone in the audience, keep those coming in. Um, and I'd like to turn over at this moment to Ollie um, Boulderson, who will take us through um, his presentation. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so I'm Ollie Boulderson. I'm a principal transport consultant at Momentum Transport Consultancy. We're a London based consultancy looking at human scale transport is really how we we look at the world. Um, just talk you through a few slides, and this is a culmination of work that we've done with with Max for his dissertation and also with Marion in a partnership with, with CXT recently. So there's a, there's a few different types of user journeys that um, micro mobility can take. One is that the commuter last mile that get off the train in a central station and go to work. One is the kind of fun urban tourist model of, of scooting around instead of taking a bus. And the last one that I'd like to talk more about is the sort of outer edge type of trip where we potentially can start replacing trips by private car. So this is a, um, a map of, of outer London and for all its complexity, there's a kind of simple message here. When in outer London, you can be going to a station or from a station on your way to work as part of a multimodal trip to get to central London, or you could be going to and from a town centre for leisure, shopping, meeting friends, if anyone remembers that, or even work in a, in a post-COVID future. So there's two different types of trip. And what we found in London is that 61% of, of outer London is within a six minute micro mobility journey of either a train station or a town center. And if you increase that catchment to 10 minutes, that's nearly 80% of London and Londoners live within 10 minutes of a town center or station in outer London by micro mobility. So we think there's huge potential possibly, you know, noting the density concerns that Marion just raised, there's, there's a huge amount to gain in, in outer London by introducing micro mobility. And what, what's the vision? How does it happen? Um, we think we need stakeholder buy-in and the stakeholder buy-in is, is really important in order to have a, a regulatory and design process that is complementary for all road users so that we can design at a human scale. So what I hope these renders show is a, a human scale of design and of, of movement rather than a much more car-centric approach that outer London, especially in the edges of cities, traditionally a designed app. That stakeholder buying can also kind of start linking complementary um, offers. So as well as passenger micromobility, there's potentially really improved opportunity for cargo and e-cargo bikes to perform first and last mile freight delivery. So there's some complement complementary options here that are really worth exploring through kind of multi-stakeholder approach. Secondly, we think that infrastructure is the absolutely critical element to achieving really good um, human scale design at the edge of cities. And that's about both parking and sort of the routes. So we agree with, with what Max and marion has been saying that parking is, is absolutely essential at, at destinations like stations and, and at origins like people's houses. So 
at developments, we need really, really close, convenient, quality parking that doesn't clutter the pavements or footways so that we, we don't kind of get in the way of people with trams or people with disabilities. So that's a really important element of, of achieving convenient quality. And then there's also the routes. So we need to start to think about micromobility in a way that London thought about cycling maybe 20 years ago and have a really progressive approach to designing segregated high quality lanes so that people feel safe at, at traveling or micro mobility on micromobility on bicycles and so people feel safe walking so that we are designing for a kind of a world of active travel rather than car based travel and all of those things we think kind of come together really nicely so thank you very much those are my first thoughts Brilliant, and thank you, Ollie. And um, to keep us on track, I'm going to go ahead and pass over to Marion, and then we will take some questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, good, good afternoon, good morning. For those of you who are here, it's still morning. Uh, my name is Marion Mackendo, and as Nancy said, um, I'm the head of ESG strategy and engagement at Uber. Um, I joined in April. Uh, my computer was mailed to me. Um, I've met no one, uh, none of my coworkers. Um, I work in a closet. This is not where I am right now. Um, my kids are on Zoom kindergarten downstairs, which is depressing. Just to give you guys a little context, they might come in. So just FYI. Um, as you guys, I'm sure you've heard of Uber. Um, it's a technology company with three main segments, which is uh, mobility, which you might know as rides, uh, delivery, which is primarily eats, but also is increasingly uh, covering different verticals. Like uh, you know, in Paris, we launched some flower delivery or groceries, um, ph pharmacy, and also freight. And we also offer bikes, scooters, uh, and mopeds with our partnership uh, with Lime in nearly 80 cities uh, globally now, which is more than three times the number of cities we covered when we operated uh, jump bikes um, ourselves. So last year we took an equity interest in Lime. They took over jump and we stopped direct operation of jump, but it's still very much a part of our vision uh, for the future. Um, I personally have worked um, at the intersection of business um, and environmental and social issues for over 15 years uh, from basically since I graduated uh, from LSE in, in regional and urban planning, a program which I really valued and still get a lot of value out of. This space has changed a lot um, in the last 15 years. So when I was, uh, you know, teeing up my thoughts for this presentation, I, I was, I had to Google it, but to remember that the first uh, iPhone was in 2007. Um, and the potential that that has to change cities and how it has changed cities. And, and you can imagine, um, and for those of you who were in London in 2004, that the ride hail space uh, is very different. It, I, it was very, very difficult to get an Uber uh, in 2004 uh, when I went to LSE, since it was not yet invented. Um, and uh, you know, urban planning and, and bike advocacy and the movement towards uh, livable cities and the better use of space and, and roads has all gotten bigger since then to more miles of bike lanes, more bike share, more bike parking, and an increasing focus on um, social impacts and equity and equitable access. And there's still much more work to do, which is great for the urban planning field that we have amazing folks on this panel to help analyze and improve and build better, build back better. Right. I mean, this is with COVID. We're, we're thinking about what what does the world look like when we when we move forward, and keeping equity at the heart of, of all of that. Um, so, just to, uh, foundationally, in in our view, in Uber's view, the future of transportation broadly has to be shared. Um, private car ownership is woefully inefficient. Um, it's got to be electric, and it has to be uh, multimodal, which includes uh, micro mobility and public transit. Um, we consider ourselves to be natural allies of public transit and, and a key partner as uh, in the fight against climate change. Um, so that's why at, at Uber, this is super important to us as we have a vision 2030, which is in a, a transit horizon paper we put out and that, that's, that's very, very important to us. Um, and it feeds into our uh, you know, climate change uh, commitments that we made last year to be a fully electric plat uh, mobility platform by 2040 globally and in the US, Canada um, and the EU in um, by 2030. And that is, uh, you know, the, includes fully electrifying the platform, uh, but also uh, 
uh, increased integration with public transit um, and micro mobility and, and walking um, as well, which, which is my personal favorite, although it doesn't make Uber a lot of money. Um, but at the heart of all of this, uh, for all of this to be successful is agile uh, and usefully designed public transportation, and then that last mile connection with, uh, with uh, um, micro mobility. Um, but public transit is really tough. It's really tough these days. Consumers want more. Um, they want better and, and good on them for that. Uh, they want higher quality, more dynamic services and integrated digital experiences. I don't know how many times you guys have looked at your phone and thought, I wish I could just pay for this with my phone. Like, why do I have to get out my credit card and stand in front of the machine? Especially when you travel internationally, it's difficult to figure or, or even domestically just figure out how to pay for things is difficult. Um, and and COVID-19 decimated funding sources. Um, so the recovery is going slower than, than we want it to. But the good news out there, in addition to vaccines, um, is technology. And that's part of where, where Uber can help um, transit agencies get better access to tools and technologies that they need, um, particularly on last mile technologies and, and what we consider to be the uh, the crown jewel of all of this, which is network, network planning. So I'm gonna share my screen and just, uh, uh, let's see. Um, I mean, network network planning, that, that's that's the ticket to success. It, technology is going to help us get there. And, and the key is to use data about how people move around cities, traffic patterns, moving from zone to zone, and use cases for transit to enable better network planning, better routing, um, better dispatching operations. I mean, logistics is king, right? I'm, my, my, my dad's a, a war documentary buff, particularly the Civil War in the United States. So I know a lot about logistics. And logistics is the last frontier. Logistics is what we need to what we need to tackle most and uh, in this space and, and data and technology will help us connect, centralize uh, and optimize and fundamentally variableize transit and transit costs across multiple modes of transportation, including uh, micro mobility and, and ride here where those things make make sense. So last year, uh, we acquired Route Match, which sells software to public transit agencies for data management, dispatching, trip booking, and ticketing. Um, and they lead in they lead in these areas. And um, the use of this software and this data helps uh, allow agencies to reduce the cost, reduce wait times, and flex capacity um, during periods of high demand, and and also to size their fleets for optimal efficiency, which is where these variableized, uh, on demand, highly integrated uh uh mobility management you see on the I, i'm pointing to my screen like you can see it over there uh the uh the mobility management you know variableizes much better when you have data but but uh but change is hard right change takes time and it's not easy to switch from the way things are to the way they should be um but but it's this real-time visibility across the entire transportation system, which is what's going to give agencies and planners the agility to adapt to system disruptions and, and eventually automate data integration that considers the entire system instead of trying to, you know, whack them all, try to fix issues as they as they arise. Um, similarly, on the on the rider side, you see MAS mobility as a service is going to allow riders to use technology to plan and book and pay for their complete multimodal journey across public and private, walking, uh, micro mobility trains, uh, helping with seamless multimodal trips with single payment uh, and including for paratransit trips um, so that they you can access everything from, from one app. And, and that's where this that's where this is heading. Um, we we believe fundamentally that there's going to be a massive transformation over the next 10 years that and the, at the center of it is holistic network design which is facilitated by data and technology and variableization and you know bus and rail are, are going to be at the center of it all moving huge numbers of people across dense urban corridors but micro mobility a uh, micro transit and ride sharing are gonna they're only gonna go up uh, it's it's just it, it just makes sense um and this is going to all play out um but agility is, is the key and, and I think that's a that's a place where micromobility and data um, and, and ride hill can can help fill some of those gaps. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We've got a number of questions coming through. Um, we've had one who asks um, about um, Ed Bacon's theory of simultaneous movement systems. And although I'm not an expert um, in his work at all, my understanding is um, he wrote in the 70s about um, both this idea of network connectivity within cities and, and how um, that 
how transport rides and walking and kind of networks actually impact on cities and their shape of, of how they develop. And I'm wondering for all of you, um, kind of in light of that question, um, what role does the context of each city um, kind of play in, in the kind of micro mobility story? Is Paris different from London, different from San Francisco? Um, so I wondered if the panel could address that. Maybe I can start with Paris. Um, uh, I, I think the interesting thing about Paris is that it really turned into a micromobility battleground after the launch of the first service. We had up to 15 operators, uh, huge fleets, and that can be explained by the fact that Paris is the densest city in Europe with 20,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, and also a third of these people working in higher intellectual professions and being uh, quite wealthy. So for service operators, if you if you put one dockless in scooter on the Paris street, you'll have about a third of people living around it that might use it. So, uh, but this is associated to the fact that in Paris, uh, car trips actually represent a very uh, short share of trips. So in Paris, uh, uh, shared e-scooters have mostly contributed to, um, say they have eased into modality, but they have mostly captured walking trips, public transport trips, uh, which is not necessarily bad, given that our public transport is very congested and, and anything that can release pressure from the network is interesting. But uh, I think Micromobility is always very context specific, and I have presented uh, some of uh, six, six days uh, results from Paris uh, to panels with researchers based in Australia, in America, uh, telling me that micromobility represents an asset to uh, move away from car based mobility, uh, and it could in other cities, but in Paris it plays a different role and one that we should directly engage with because it can also be an interesting one. I'd, I'd maybe add that. Um, maybe one point of commonality across a number of cities is the way that their transport networks have historically been designed to transport people from the edge of cities to the centre of cities in a very kind of commute heavy approach to network design. And I think one of the kind of major benefits of, of micro mobility is that as, as an infrastructure, it's very agile and kind of light, which means that it's, it's really able to address some of those gaps when we're living in a more polycentric style as we go between suburb to suburb to go and meet friends and work and I, I really think that the um kind of the, the urban model of, of a very dense center where all employment happens is, is is probably in the past especially post covid and I think we'll have a much more flexible way of working and living and micro mobility can can really complement that kind of um transport with a very light and agile infrastructure. Ali, just to, uh, to to build on that and take a slightly different angle is uh, you know the, how different cities, suburb to suburb, or how how uh, micro mobility works in cities. To, uh, slightly different approaches. How different cities have different relationships with cycling and micro mobility and but almost all have struggled to provide a safe space for it and and that's especially true in the united states uh, or in some parts of the united states and i'm sure in many other parts where it just it, the city's context really matters when you're talking about creating safe uh, infrastructure so so that for us when we're thinking about micro mobility and the and the in the context of cities or, or movement more broadly is that roads have to be have to be safe um, and we also are very well aware that it's those behind the wheel that bear the biggest responsibility um, in keeping streets safe so so one of the things that uber does is trying to address on this is continuing to invest in driver focused safety products and, and education including it we, we i think it was last year year before we we introduced a bike lane alerts feature letting uh which overlays bike routes with passenger drop off um, locations and sends pop-ups to to the rider hey watch out for people before you exit like to, when you open your door and we also try to make a point and, and this is very small but i think it does make a difference that we we do try to say people on bikes 
um, instead of cyclists, because humanizing riders uh, is, is also an important part of, of safety. So when we move forward, and, and there will be an increasing reliance on micromobility and an increasing integration with transit, um, we, we, we it's we're, it's incumbent upon us and, and also, you know, everyone else call everyone to prioritize safety through, uh, you know, rider safety, driver awareness, um, and, and safer infrastructure too. So, so that's one thing that we focus on is, is building technology to protect people uh, protect people on bikes um, in the context of any individual city where where people will be increasingly using micro mobility and not, might not be familiar with it you know it could be someone's hopping on a on a bike in a city that they're visiting for the first time and and we think it's important to make sure that safety is at the core of all of it brilliant and um carrying on from kind of context and um these issues of safety and usability We've got a question, it was um, directed specifically at Marion. Um, and she is asking about um, disability and the use of things like the Paris Metro system. Um, and asking really how that architecture in that context um, really impacts on the um, usability of those stations for disabled people or people with strollers. Um, and in fact, I was talking to a student only, I think this week, um, about um, London, and she's a disabled student or a disabled person who really finds it very difficult to negotiate the transport system, the tube system um, in London, and in fact, buses as well, just because of the manner in which that's set up. And she was wondering if you, and I'll open this to the panel, if anyone knows anything about um, any research conducted or any kind of useful information um, out there about that issue specifically. Well, that's a very important question. Um, I'm afraid CITE has not yet researched uh, disability and micromobility in Paris, but I'm really happy this question was raised because it's uh, worth reminding that in Paris, only 3% of the metro network is accessible, uh, which is one of the poorest figure uh, in the world. By comparison, London has 18% uh, of accessible stations, but Tokyo has 88%. So we are really far behind in Paris, which means that not only does the city has to answer the challenge of sustainable mobility, but easing mobility of disabled people in Paris is, uh, is really an emergency. Uh, and I think uh, though uh, this has not been directly addressed during the micromobility boom, uh, this micromobility boom has also uh, shed light on the importance of making Paris more uh, friendly to a variety of users beyond cars. So uh, cycling lanes are developing, the newly delivered cycling lanes are of better quality because the cycling lanes in Paris, uh, those that were delivered in the past are very narrow, which means that they are not uh, adapted to uh, adapted bicycles, bicycle used by disabled users. Most of the bicycle parking in Paris is also not uh, fit for adapted bicycles. So uh, uh, there's, uh, we are very much uh, behind on that account. Uh, and I think maybe seeing uh, a variety of vehicles uh, on the streets of Paris on cycling lanes on the sidewalk when they cannot go on cycling lane might also raise awareness of how fast we should address that. I think it actually also fits into something that Marion said um, about kind of uh, talking about bike users or people on bikes rather than cyclists. There's a um, lack of um, making people real, humanizing people sometimes. And I think that there's a lot of prejudice around what we believe people who have um, disabilities can and cannot do. Whereas cycling is something often that people can do more easily than actually walking or other forms of transport in that sense. So I agree. I think when we're designing these things, we need to actually consider it far more broadly in terms of bike lanes, turning radiuses, parking and all of that. Um, we also have a question um, which I think is really interesting and I, I have to put a disclaimer in for the person who asked this. Um, I just myself came back from Texas so this is a question um, that interests me greatly. Um, and the question is how does a fully electric platform become reliable um, if we assumed it will be energized, in this case, by renewable energies, when we see what happened um, in places like Texas, um, how does one deal with the infrastructure and energy storage? 
um, central like text, uh, Tesla batteries um, and that kind of thing. So how do you think that this could be implemented um, without, um, it, how could this kind of full electri um, electrification be implemented? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. And it's a really important one. And uh, my answer is uh, climate is a team sport. That's, that's what our, uh, our CEO says. And when we came out with our commitment to be a, a fully electric platform by 2040, we are reliant upon uh, policy environments that enable that to us. And part of our commitment is to signal to folks who are building the infrastructure and who are building the grids and greening the grids and making them more uh, uh, re full, uh, renewable energy uh, centric is we're all in this together and, and Uber and our electric platform that's that's our commitment and we, we believe in four to six years you know battery technology is going to make this easier but we didn't feel like we had four to six years to make this commitment uh we wanted to get the you know jolt the flywheel and, and get this started and signal to our our partners partners around the world including cities and city planners and policymakers and folks who are working on the grid that says hey look uber's in this we we, we want to be a partner as, as this solution so the answer to the question is i I hope, I think there's, I am confident there are thousands of people working now on increasing the reliability of the grid as the world transitions to a lower carbon economy, but it, it's not part of what I work on. No, understood. And I, I do think that it's, it is a matter of grid reliability and grid maintenance. Um, certainly the problem in Texas was a lot down to just very poor grid maintenance rather than, um, I don't know if the question was directed at that, but rather than renewables, which I think in the winter time, uh, Texas draws like 4% of the electricity from. So there's a lot of um, kind of factors in this that um, are very interesting and it will be fascinating to see how we go forward. Um, we also have a question in on, um, where you see micro mobility working the most and where you're able to provide a hub with some kind of scale, i.e. a large new development. Um, and how do people get to the transport? What about areas of existing housing? How would you actually be able to, it's maybe easy to put um, one of these hubs in a new development, but how do you retrofit that into um, existing housing and existing neighborhoods? Yeah, I think I could. Well, I think Ollie and I both probably have a similar answer for this. But um, yeah, it, it was something that we looked at. And um, yeah, in terms of, I think, new developments, I, I absolutely think that new developments should have um, space allocated for micromobility. Um, specifically, a question that Ollie and I um, looked at over the last few months was the issue of public transport accessibility. Uh, public transport accessibility levels in London, or they're called PTOL. So pretty much um, the London government and uh, Transport for London um, assign essentially uh, new developments are assigned a PTOL score about how connected they are to the public transport network, essentially how accessible they are. And so pretty much the idea that we had, and we, we spoke to a lot of interviewees, um, was do you think that these uh, scores should include micromobility? Because right now they don't even, they don't include cycling um, and they don't include micromobility. And I think that um, especially if you could let developers hypothetically say, okay, if you wanna build this development and you wanna build it a little bit denser than the existing regulations are, um, you can do that maybe you know so long as you add in provision for X amount of e-bikes or e-scooters. So again, those discussions aren't mature yet, but I think that is something that uh, at least is starting to be discussed. And how do you, yeah, we're alloc how do you get developers to allocate space? I just add up talking about kind of hubs. It's a really um, hot topic at the moment in in UK transport planning, um, and it's sort of talking through that complementary nature of a few different um, bits of sustainable and active transport that we were all kind of really interested in doing. So if I were to have a wish list of what an outer London micro mobility hub had, it would be it would be a freight hub where I would at the end of the day when I'm on my way home, I'd pick up my parcels that were, you know, if I'm not in, I'd just pick them up there. It would also be a charging hub where I could leave my shared scooter or bike and charge it up overnight. It would have cycle parking, maintenance, lockers, it might even have a gym, and it's a celebration of active uh, and sustainable travel in that sense. So you start to really group it and, and create a celebration of 
not just micro mobility, but walking and cycling and, and kind of all the good things that, that we're, we're trying to achieve in, in outer London so that people don't, they can do that whole journey home and think, wow, that was so convenient. I don't even miss my car at all. In fact, I've got one of those tasks done that I needed to do on my way home. I'd have maintenance in there, maybe a cafe. I might even have a bus stop outside so that it's complimentary and I could do an onward journey, maybe not to my home, but maybe to go go to see a friend in a bar around the corner or whatever. So I think grouping those things is a really interesting prospect. That can't be done everywhere. Um, that's a really you know aspirational thing, but that can be treated as a bit of a menu of options and, and kind of used in a block format. Um, all around the edges of not just London, but but anywhere really. And I think in pieces of public realm or redundant parts of basements or ground floors, then being kind of active and, and agile with how that's used could be really, really interesting. I actually have a, um, if I could share my screen for a second, um, a rendering in the report that Ali and I had made with Momentum that I think kind of shows uh, what it could look like. Let me just share. So this was, again, just this could be any development, I mean, in London or anywhere else. But again, just the idea of kind of having a hub somewhere and inside, ideally, that there would be charging spaces. So then you could charge the vehicles there. So you don't have to have a juicing vehicle, pick it up at night. Um, and then also just uh, the clear signage. Um, you know, we kind of took like the underground with a little like micro uh, lightning symbol. So yeah, just having those potentially at new developments. Uh, or, or retrofitting older developments with those, I think, yeah, could be, uh, and then building on everything that Ali said could could be exciting. Yeah, just anecdotally, I, I live in Berkeley, California. I live literally next door to the the BART station, and they're they're thinking about uh, where they, they've approved to put housing above it, which of course I support as a as an urban planner. And I think it'll be it's either three, five, or fifty stories. I'm I'm not sure which I should pay more attention, but I do know that they're putting it in without parking. Um, and what does that mean to be building these large uh, housing complexes without without any place to put a private car? And, and I think that that's, that's exactly where, um, you know, multimodal uh, micromobility comes in, where you have, you do have car share, you do have, um, you know, parking, you have places for charging so, so that that is a decision that's easy to make. I mean, ultimately, it's got to be cheaper. It's got to be better for people's quality of life. It's got to be more convenient. And I and I think that this this your rendering like is exactly that that is part of a piece of that story of, of how we make this part of everyday, you know, just a network rather than you know it piecing together in individual modes of transportation, but but a whole seamless experience from the time you wake up till the time you go to work, come back, or whatever you do during the day. I'd just really quickly add that stations all have massive car parks outside. So as, as people use micromobility more, we, you've got a ready-made piece of land for those hubs at every station. That's where my kids learned to ride their bikes was the massive empty parking lot next door to my house. That's where I learned to drive my car. It's such a bad thing, <laughs> um, but yes. So another question, which I think is really interesting, and someone's come in um, and they're talking about this from a Southeast Asian context. Um, but what they're wondering is that, you know, as cities are developing and densifying um, in the global South, um, shouldn't these things be coming in much quicker and much more early? Um, and that there's, there tends to be a kind of um, bias in the discourse, you could imagine that, um, micro mobility and things like this are really the, the concern of um, mature advanced cities. And they want to know, are there ways that this can be pushed more for cities that are currently developing? So that going back to the very first point that was raised so that we can actually avoid creating urban contexts where this is not something easy to um, implement. I think that's a fascinating question and it goes back to the points we were all making about the importance of infrastructure and adapting cities to a variety of, uh, of mobilities because I think Paris is an example of a city that is not well adapted to receiving new modes because it's so dense, a lot of heritage, very narrow sidewalks, etc. So I think 
uh, this question connects also to the fact that in many of uh, uh, in many Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, there's already an existing cycling practice, for instance, which is very much unacknowledged, uh, which is not planned for, uh, but that connect to this micro mobility boom. So planning cities around uh, alternative uh, personal modes of, of transport, may they be uh, mechanical, electric, uh, cycling, or micro mobility, uh, is an emergency. But I think it connects with the issue of cycling because what we observed uh, with this micromobility boom in Europe was that in cities where there already was space for cycling, these services were very attractive and very efficient quickly, while in other cities that had not planned well for cycling before, there was a lot of clutter, a lot of uh, problems of unsafety for pedestrians on the sidewalk, etc. Et so yeah, to me, it connects to the issue of making cities more cyclable and more walkable. And um, I do think that it is something that is um, incredibly important, but we also need to remember that a lot of cities, for example, in China and things like that, had a great amount of micromobility before we, before they started sort of pursuing and developing that kind of car infrastructure. So in many respects, the culture of cycling is there. Um, and it's just a matter of um, kind of remembering that maybe and ad adapting. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of af aphorisms. Um, uh, my husband works in real estate, so I think the whole industry is just uh, is built around aphorisms. And one that he always says is, you know, skate where the hockey puck is going, uh, not where it is. And you want to make sure that you're looking forward to what's happening. And I'm sure we've all had the experience that it's very easy to work with governments and get them to think 30 years out when you <laughs> when you're planning infrastructure. <laughs> but uh, but I mean, that's best case scenario is, is you're looking at, in, in all areas and all geographies and thinking, OK, where are we going? What is this looking like? <clears throat> but, you know, that's. As I said earlier, you know, the iPhone wasn't even around uh, when I was in the program at LSC. So it's, it's not always easy to forecast um, changes in demographics or behavior or, you know, how a transition from micro mobility to private car ownership and back. Like, what, what, what does this journey look like? And it's very unique for, for every region and, ev and every city. I guess as well, we could kind of think about this um, as I guess everyone is thinking about everything in the context of COVID at the moment. Um, and you could look at something like micromobility as um, having a number of potential different effects. So there's all the talk in Paris about having the 15 minute city, um, which, you know, you can actually get around and get to everything within a very short amount of time and have lots of items to get to. Um, and I can see where micromobility could play a big role in that, um, because it's also kind of a personal sense of personal transport. So you're not actually sitting next to a lot of people, which potentially is not what we want to do at the moment. Um, but with something like that, um, is the role of density hugely important? Must we have dense places for this then to work? And really in the context of something like COVID, um, does this call for densifying suburbs or trying to um, create new services where people are able through micromobility to get around and do shopping and things like that if um, larger forms of transport aren't something that we want to do. I think, I think um, as, as Marion spoke about earlier, that density is a hugely important issue for micromobility operators. And, and I think business cases go massively, they hinge on, on density. I guess the one thing I'd say to, to flip the question a bit is that micromobility and really good quality design and infrastructure for cycling and, and micromobility can can facilitate a much greater residential density in in new parts of the areas that are coming forward for development where you don't need huge parking lots but you can just have your great little hubs that we spoke about earlier and they can they can facilitate density rather than um, react to it but Absolutely, it is, it is a massive concern, I think, in, in existing suburbs, yeah. 
And to, to complement on that, it's a, a question we asked ourselves in Paris, uh, especially as we were thinking about this first mile, last mile issue, given that within Paris, accessing public transport is not really an issue. How could we um, bring these services to, to, to the suburbs to uh, ease access to public transport? And uh, my firm was uh, involved in a consultation by the Greater Paris Metropolitan Forum on how to change the uses of highways and fast roads to to, uh, towards alternative mobility and we organized a workshop with uh, shared uh, micro mobility operators uh, in Paris and asked them what would be the conditions for you to uh, offer your service around this station or this station and showing different examples of stations we could create on highways in the greater Paris area uh, and a key point that was raised was that well first density is necessary to keep vehicles moving and not have uh, vehicles that are left in a corner and then can be can be in a bad state when they are recovered. So there's a, a business issue managing uh, in in less dense area is complicated. Uh, but they, the the operators we worked with also underlined that local authorities can play a role in easing that. And it goes back to the work that Ollie and Maxwell have done on hubs. Uh, a lot of operators said if we were provided with a space to store and charge vehicles around that station, maybe we, this eases management and they, they acknowledged that this was a new model. It's not the way they had planned their service initially within Paris, but that could work uh, if, they, if they were to do it hand in hand with the local authority. Um, and I think uh, this, uh, if we compare it to um, train stations in other countries, like in Tokyo, 16% of all metro trips within Greater Tokyo are intermodal with a bicycle. So that took planning and a lot of uh, bicycle parking is offered around these stations. So if we want micro mobility to work in these areas, I think the role of local authorities is key. Yeah, also I know to, to a hammer, everything's a nail, but ride sharing, um, you know, when you, have, when you have low ridership environments and these rigid cost structures can limit the ability to provide flexible and high quality service. So if you supplement, uh, variable cost supply into this mix, public transportation agencies are better able to respond in these low, low density uh, areas and also areas where warehouse districts are areas where you're not seeing the density that you need to support maybe a more fixed cost uh, structure. Um, so Uber, right, you know, what we do is we contract with agencies to, with technology solutions to help help uh, these programs first and last mile, uh, guaranteed rides homes, microtransit, uh, late night paratransits to, to help in these specific use cases where uh, density may not be um, where it is to support something that might be more traditional. And I think just in terms of a comment or a question for everyone to answer as we kind of wrap up. Um, it strikes me that a lot of the micromobility is about trying to create seamless transport. And I think, Marin, you touched on this before, that that's also part of fare structure and payment structure so that you're not having to try to figure out how to pay in different places at different rates for different tickets. Um, what are the barriers and what are the possibilities, I guess, for the whole panel for your specific cities? of being able to implement something like um, a single fare structure, a single payment structure, a single way of paying um, so that you can have seamless and integrated transport. Well, I, I could, um, I guess, kick this one off. Um, in in the, my dissertation, the report with Ali, we, we definitely looked at this. And I think in London, um, and well, Ali, I'm sure will compliment this, but um, in, in London, I think there is a role for the train operating companies, all the talks to play and working with micromobility operators. Now it remains to be seen if they work directly, talk to micromobility operator or have a mobility as a service kind of third party um, app working in between. Um, and then also something else that we've discussed is I think another barrier um, is when you have multiple micro, multiple micromobility operators either uh, working at uh, operating at the same station or even really in the same city, um, it can be confusing because if you have uh, Lime uh, downloaded on your phone, but then, um, oh, there's only like a bird or a spin scooter, and then it's like, oh, now I have to download that app. So um, something that we've discussed is, is there a role for in London TFL to play and potentially even license um, a bunch of different operators so that they could all kind of be branded as TFL or like Santander scooters. Um, so it could kind of all be the same payment system, even though behind the scenes, um, there, there'd be many different kind of private operators uh, working together or working against each other, I should say. 
Well, maybe to complement on that, uh, thinking about fair integration in the context of Paris makes me think about equity, because in Paris, public transport is highly subsidized. So to give you some context on that, uh, an unlimited public transport ticket for a month costs about uh, 70 euros, and half of this is paid by your firm. So out of your pocket is only 35 euros for transport everywhere in Paris. Um, so that clashes a bit with the business model of uh, private micromobility operators. And uh, when we conducted user surveys uh, in Paris, we also found that the profile of uh, micromobility users in Paris is not really, uh, it's far from inclusive. We have a great overrepresentation of people working in managerial professions, great overrepresentation of men. Um, uh, so given that maybe uh, some cities such as Madrid are launching their own mobility as a service system managed by the local authority to think about these issues. And I think, again, uh, if we want these services to be equitable, there's work to be done by the local authority uh, with the private operator. And this raises the question, should these services be subsidized? Uh, should public funds be used for infrastructure. So there are a lot of questions about race, but yeah, I think this point of equity when compared to the model of public transport in Paris appears very important. Well, and, and just to, to build on that, you know, some people don't have bank accounts. Uh, some people don't have smartphones. And how do you, how do you uh, make sure these new modes of transportation that we're offering, these new innovative approaches don't raise new barriers to access in ways that you know we don't anticipate? So we do offer call centers and cash funded cars to help reduce these barriers, but it's really interesting to think when you're, you come up with this really cool seamless consumer experience to make sure that we're making the, 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 the world easier to navigate for, for everyone. No, I think that's a really good point. Um, we're doing a class on Friday on smart cities and this idea of access is incredibly important and, and the point of wanting to share your data or not wanting to share your data. But certainly as well, there, is, um, there are problems with people not having access to phones or banks or not wanting to have access to them um, and not actually um, keeping those people out of the system itself. Um, I see that we've come to five o'clock, um, which was our end time. Um, um, if anyone would like to say a couple of last things, um, we'd be absolutely happy for you to. Um, I was just looking, Ollie, you looked um, almost like you were going to say something. I didn't want to cut you off. That's okay. Um, I was just going to come back to that. Um seamless integration and, and how how a kind of vision could or maybe should look. Um, I think that an ambitious transport authority could not only be an operator of, of services in the way that Transport for London operates the tube network, but it could be a licensor and, and it sits above a whole kind of hodgepodge, this is my non-technical term of a whole kind of mix of, of transport operators, some of which may be public, some of which may be private. And in so doing, it can it can assure a reasonable price and also a reasonable service delivery across London so that routes that aren't profitable but are necessary or, or, or beneficial for kind of wider social good are required to be implemented by operators uh, in a similar way to how buses work in, in London. And... and that kind of system which has a centralized licensing authority directing but also enabling private operators to work could be a really interesting future system where we, we get our kind of benefits of our mobility as a service but we we, we try and mitigate the the equity issues and, and issues around not providing unprofitable services yeah. okay guys i'm going to um wrap us up and just say thank you very much it's been um a really very interesting discussion there have been some lovely comments as well in the um chat um so it leaves me just to say thank you to um marion marion which is very difficult to say both names at the same time max and ollie for coming and speaking with us today we will be doing some more events um, and we will be getting back to everyone um, via Facebook to let you know when those will be. Uh, thanks very much for joining us and we hope you enjoyed it. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.